today we're continuing in the Discipleship 101 series, Responding to God with Worship. And today we're covering principles four and five, if you're following along on the website. Responding to God with Worship in Obedience and in All of Life. Uh, let's take a look at the word obedience. What does it mean? We know it's the act of obeying. To obey means to comply with or follow the commands or instructions of God, submitting to God's authority. Another Greek word for obey in the New Testament means to trust. Obedience is an act of worship. When we're obedient, we're saying, God, I surrender my will to yours. I know that you have a divine plan for my life, and you will guide me, guide my steps, and I will follow in absolute trust and confidence. We need to submit to God before we can obey him with the whole heart. So we know, need to know the uh, difference between submitting and obeying. And they're often looked at together and they're different. Obey, the biblical word for obey comes from the Greek, hupaku, which means to listen attentively by implication to heed or conform to a command or authority. This word conveys the idea of actively, actively following a command. There is no choice in the matter. It is to be done whether one agrees with it or not. Obedience is involuntary. The secular example that popped up into my mind was paying taxes. <laughs> Our government doesn't say, please pay your taxes. <laughs> they say, pay them or you will be penalized. So now let's look at submit. The biblical word submit comes from the Greeks, hupaiko, which means to yield, to passively surrender to an authority. Submission is similar to obedience, but in this case, you can ask the question of what is being commanded. Submission is voluntary. For example, if Rick asks me to open the service with a prayer, I agree to it because I submit to his authority as a church leader. So now that we understand the difference between submission and obedience, let's dig in a little deeper. So let's see what the Bible says about obedience. And the first thing we're going to look at are some good examples of obedience in the Bible. And for most of us, the first person that comes to mind is Abraham. <laughs> Abraham, he showed great faith and trust in God. In Genesis 12, God told him to leave his country and his family, and he would make him into a great nation. So he went. That's what the Bible says. He went. Can you imagine? That's never happened before. You don't have any children, and God is telling you that he's going to make a great nation of you. That takes a lot of faith. He believed God without question. And then in Genesis 14... God told him he would have a son, and he was about 100 years old. So God gives him a son. Can you imagine the joy he felt waiting? Him and Sarah waited their whole lives, and in their old age, they had Isaac. Can you imagine they were just, that was a true miracle of the physical. But then again, later on, God asked Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. He asked Abraham to go to Moriah and sacrifice him. Can you imagine the thoughts that were running through Abraham's mind? He trusted God, but he had to wonder. But the very next verse, again, tells us that Abraham, he got up, he packed, he cut wood for the burnt offering, and traveled with Isaac to the place that God told him to go. It says Abraham built the altar, he bound Isaac, he laid him on the altar, and he raised his hand to slay Isaac, and God stopped him. It was a test of obedience, and Abraham was obedient. He didn't try to reason his way out of it, and I bet he didn't procrastinate. He did exactly what God told him to do when God told him to do it. He didn't waver. So let's look at another example of Noah. You know, Noah is a good example of also having God's favor. 
through obedience. God was going to destroy all of mankind because of their wickedness. But Genesis 6 says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of God because he was obedient. So God tells Noah he's going to destroy all the people and everything on the earth. And he tells Noah to build an ark on dry land. And I know we all know the story. Imagine people walking by watching Noah build an ark on dry land. How's it ever going to float? Didn't bother Noah, though. He was faithful to God. So God tells Noah exactly how to build the ark. He gives him the precise materials and the measurements. And it says in the Bible, Noah did everything exactly as God commanded him. So Noah, he obeyed exactly in the way and the time God wanted something to done and something done, and we need to do that as well. That's wholehearted submission and obedience. Both Abraham and Noah believed, submitted, and obeyed. Now let's look at the ultimate example, and that's Jesus. He was obedient. In the Bible, when he was baptized, remember the dove descended on him, and it said, God said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Why was God pleased? We don't see a lot in Scripture about Christ when he was young, but there was the time when he was in the temple teaching, and he had run from his parents, and his parents were looking for him, frantic, trying to find him. That ended up, it came out as this, and this is in the message. So he went, but once his parents found him, and they rebuked him a little, he, so he went back to Nazareth with them and lived obediently with them. So Jesus submitted to his parents when he was young. And that's why God was pleased with him. And also, when Jesus was dealing with Satan in the desert, he used obedience in God's word in defense in resisting Satan. So Jesus showed us that obedience to God is very important to defeating our spiritual enemy, Satan. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, whom God protects from harm. But it also says, only when we submit ourselves to God that the devil will flee from us. Often when we look at that scripture, we see the part of resist the devil and he will flee from us. But we forget the submit part. We have to submit. We can't have the power of the Lord unless we have submitted ourselves fully to him and obey him. Every element of our spiritual armor involves submission to God. We are protected by God's truth, God's righteousness, God's gospel, God's faith, God's salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Those protect us. And Jesus says, but even more blessed are all who hear the Word of God and put it into practice. Obedience. And James 1 leaves us no doubt. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Do we obey God wholeheartedly? Like the examples that we've seen? Do we do whatever he asked us to do without reservation or hesitation? Do we do it without delay? Do we procrastinate? Delayed obedience is actually disobedience. Sometimes we offer 
partial obedience. We pick and choose God's commands that we want to obey. We obey the ones that we like and are easy and ignore those we think are unreasonable, difficult, expensive, or unpopular. An example, I'll attend church, but I won't tithe. And again, I'm talking about those that are able to do. You know that you're able to tithe and you don't tithe. How about, I'll read my Bible, but I won't forgive my friend. Wholehearted obedience is done joyfully and with enthusiasm. Colossians 3 says, Whatever you do, work at it wholeheartedly as though you were doing it for the Lord and not merely for people. I was watching a sermon by Joyce Meyer the other day, and it was on obedience and self-control. And those are two areas that the Holy Spirit is working with me a great deal because I asked for it. I said 2016 was going to be my year of self-discipline and obedience, no matter what it takes. I told God I want it more than anything else in life. <laughs> and he has answered that prayer. He is answering that prayer. And she was talking about her ministry. And you know, if you know Joyce Meyer, she has a worldwide ministry. She started out with a Bible study in her home, and she had it for years. And she prayed and prayed and prayed for growth. And she thought that the devil was, or Satan was interfering, so she rebuked him. She said she rebuked him and rebuked him. It was a very a humorous thing she was talking about. But anyway, you'll have to watch it. And then... After she was praying one day, she said God told her that she needed to submit to her husband, Dave, before he would bless her ministry. And then she admitted how she had been sarcastic a lot and hadn't been respectful. And so she repented of that, and she started being obedient. And look at where she is today. She's told a couple of stories of being obedient to the Holy Spirit, especially in giving things. I remember her telling of a dress, a beautiful dress she had. The Holy Spirit told her to give it to a certain woman, and she didn't want to do it. She liked that dress, but she wound up giving it to her eventually, but she did, <laughs> she resisted. So kind of gives us a little, the Holy Spirit will bring us where we're going to go, but knowing others are going through the same things as us is kind of a little comforting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, submission, obedience, you know, God's really working with me in my spiritual life and in my work life. I have a job that's very stressful. We have a company that bought several companies and crammed them all together, and we all have to be on these same systems. It's chaos, constant chaos and change. There's infighting with managers from all these companies. We're trying to keep up, and we... I'm in a customer support type role, and the systems that we use are in chaos. It's a second job just to use the system to do my job, and it's just constant. God's working with me in that. It's giving me some peace in that, but there was a change in December that was really hard for me in that we have a new leader who is young, he's competitive, and he pushes and I've been an IT director. I, I know my job, I know what to do, and I, God's working with me on that. It's very hard for me because this person was put in his position. He's a fine person, you know, I like him just fine because of seniority. So I'm having to submit to a lot here. It is very hard for me. I've had bad attitudes many days, but I just decided just to get in there, God, please, Show me how I can let go of this anger, you know, and this disagreement I have, this negativity, because I know deep in my heart God will not move me forward until I deal with that. And he is. It's still not easy, and it's kind of coming in little steps, but I'm getting there. But it just is so comforting to know that I have the Holy Spirit. God has a plan for me. He's in charge. He knows that situation. 
And I'll be in that situation as long as he says I'll be in it. I don't know when, you know, it's going to end. But my job, that's God's responsibility, is working things out for me. My job is to submit and to obey, and I know that. I know that in my spirit because the Holy Spirit tells me that. And that's how I'm dealing with it. I couldn't do it without God. It would have been just a superficial thing, just obeying because I had to. But I'm obeying because I want to obey God. That's, there's a difference, and that makes the difference. And I feel like as I go through that trial, as I submit and obey, God will bring me to a better job, whether it's with this company or not, or he relieves the situation, whatever it might be. But still, it's all about submitting and obeying. It's amazing. I wake up thinking it and praying it. I think about it all day long, and I go to bed thinking about it. And it just feels good knowing the Holy Spirit's working with me, and he'll work with you too. If you want something that's good, bad enough, God will help you with it because he always gives good things to those who ask. If you want to have a closer relationship with God and develop intimacy, I believe obeying and submitting is one way to get there. We need to obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit. We all know what those are. When you get finished with your groceries out in the parking lot, take the cart and put it in its little bay that it's supposed to go on. Those little things matter. Little things matter to God. You see a need and you can meet it, you do it. You see someone who needs money and you have the ability to give it to them, you give it to them right then and you do it with a joyful heart. You won't have, I have learned through experience, you won't have joy and peace if you don't obey those promptings of the Spirit. Some people might hear voice of God sometimes. Me, it's, I know it's the Holy Spirit. And there's been times when I've left places like Walmart and we've, there's been heavy traffic and there's someone right there. And I'm, I'm more worried about traffic than I am about helping that person. And let me tell you, it pricks my heart. That's what I call it, pricks my heart. I know I should have done something. I didn't do it. <laughs> but try to listen to those promptings. It'll, you'll have peace and you'll also bless others and you glorify God. So we've seen a few fruits of the obedience, but let's look at a few more. Uh, obedience brings glory to God. In John 17, Jesus said, I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. That's us. We have work to do as well. Obedience brings pleasure to God. Psalm 147 says, The Lord takes pleasure in those who worship him, in those who trust his love. And Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, in the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your, excuse me, your Father in heaven. So people see what we do. When we do good things and we're good to each other and others and help and volunteer, people see that. It's a witness. Obedience to God also proves our love for God. 1 John 5 says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. I used to think obedience wasn't a very good word. I didn't like it. I didn't grow up with a lot of discipline. I didn't want to be obedient. But obeying God is, it's good. And I don't look at it the same way anymore because the Holy Spirit's worked with me and it's shown me really what obedience is and it is a good thing. It's like when I submit and obey, I can rest in God's love and just let him take care of everything. I don't have to worry, fret. I was telling Rick, I'm like, I get claws on everything. I have a hard time letting, I want to get in there and make things work and, you know, I have to back off where that's concerned, just like my job. Back off. Relax. 
be submissive, obey God, and I know I don't have to worry about anything. It releases me. It's freedom. That's what the Bible says. You know, it's freedom. Uh, Second John, and this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. And he also says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And the Holy Spirit, that's scripture, that's exactly what the Holy Spirit is doing with me right now. I, I'm living in God's love, and that's such a wonderful place to be. In 1 John, and we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. <laughs> If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Our, let's be clear, our obedience doesn't save us. Grace saves us. Christ saves us. We could never obey perfectly. We all fall short. But we all rely on the mercy of our Savior. We love him and we obey him not to earn salvation because you cannot earn salvation. It is a gift. But because he freely saved us by grace. Obedience to God demonstrates our faith and trust. Trust and obedience go hand in hand. You must trust God to obey him. You must trust that God created you for a plan. He will see it through to completion. He planned you. He planned each one of us. He wanted you to exist. And he has something special for you. It's not the same as someone else. You're special to God. He wants to be involved in your life, every little part of it, all day long. Psalm 138 says, The Lord will complete what his purpose is for me. Lord, your gracious love is eternal. Do not abandon your personal work in me. In Isaiah 46, I've carried you since your birth. I've taken care of you from the time you were born. Even when you're old, I'll take care of you. Even when your hair turns gray, I'll support you. I made you and will continue to care for you. I'll support you and save you. God's telling us that he's going to take care of us. We should rest in that. We can trust him. Do we trust that plan he has for us? Will we walk in it? Even if we don't know what it's going to be. I don't know what my path is going to be. I know what it is right now. Those key words, submit and obey. I'm learning. By the grace of God, I am learning. Jeremiah 29 says, I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. They are plans for peace and not disaster. Plans to give you a future filled with hope. The word peace is translated shalom here, whose definition is completeness, soundness, and welfare. Obedience allows us to experience the blessings of holy living. Only Jesus Christ was perfect, therefore only he could walk in sinless obedience. But as we allow the Holy Spirit to transform us from within, we grow in holiness. When we obey the Lord, we can live a life of joy without shame, rooted deeply in the Lord and confident in our eternal hope. 
Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. A Christian's testimony of holiness is a strong witness that God is at work in the world, that he does exist. Joy, this is Psalm 119. Joyful are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil, and they walk only in his path. You have charged us to keep your commandments carefully. Oh, that my actions would consistently reflect your decrees. Then I will not be ashamed when I compare my life with your commands. As I learn your righteous regulations, I will thank you by living as I should. I will obey your decrees. Please don't give up on me. I've prayed that prayer a lot. <laughs> In Isaiah 48, this is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is good for you and leads you along the path you should follow. Oh, that you had listened to my commands. Then you would have had peace flowing like a gentle river and righteousness rolling over you like waves in the sea. And that was talking about Israel in the Old Testament, but it also applies to us as well today. In 2 Corinthians, because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit and let us work toward complete holiness because we fear God. In Colossians, slaves obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart fearing the Lord. That's another scripture that pricks my heart. It leaves us without doubt what that means. It's all about the attitude. <laughs> We know what I service means. We must do things from the heart because we trust God's word and that it will, it's good for us. It'll only, to me, my little saying is only good produces good. <laughs> In Hebrews, obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls is they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. In 1 Samuel, Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. In this second scripture, 2 Corinthians, this is what, I believe the Holy Spirit puts in my mind a lot. It's very, very powerful. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And that was the New King James in the NIV. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That's a pretty powerful scripture. Our every thought. I know the Holy Spirit has been revealing truth to me, and I'm sure that he also does that for you, but I've just been soaring. I just have to share that. I've just been soaring lately because I have wanted this. I have wanted this so long. I was so sick of living a life of nothing. I believe that's when God started working with me is when I prayed and asked God God I want you more than anything else in life and help to break, break these strongholds that I have in my heart with disobedience and submission 
I don't want you to think I'm just rebellious about everything, but with God and certain things I am. And it's just amazing what God will do, and he'll do it for you too. It's, it's just so moving. And I finally, I was talking to Eileen, I finally know why Christians are so happy. <laughs> the ones that you've encountered in life, that they're just always so happy and they have that joy. Now I know what that is, but the Holy Spirit had to reveal that to me. I couldn't, if, if you don't have the Holy Spirit and you're not seeking it, you won't receive it. And we've talked about obedience and what it brings, the positive things it brings to our life, and we'll be remiss if we didn't discuss a little bit about disobedience. And the Bible says disobedience leads to sin and death. The disobedience of Adam brought sin and death into the world, but Christ's perfect obedience restores our friendship and our relationship with God for all of those of us who believe. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, which is Christ, the many will be made righteous. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And in Romans, he will render to each one according to his works to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality. He will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. And I know there's a scripture that talks about the weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's not something I want. And in Proverbs... Whoever, despi whoever despises the word brings destruction on himself, but he who reveres the commandment will be rewarded. And he tells us, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And that's on the path that we're on. As I've learned in Bible study, we don't have to worry about Satan. When our hearts are set on God and we're submitting and obeying, we don't have to worry about the ugly stuff. In the second part of our message, we talked about uh, the first part, uh, worshiping God through obedience. Now we're going to move on to worshiping God in all we do. In Matthew 22... Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Everything the Bible says about good behavior is based on those scriptures, on that foundation. Jesus worshiped God in all he did. He served others in numerous ways. He forgave, he encouraged, he prayed for, he healed, and of course he gave the ultimate service, which was his life. He died for us so that we could have a relationship with the Father. And by his example, relationships are important. Relationship with God and with each other. And Hosea stressed that the interpersonal relationships among each other are more important than the mechanics of worship. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. Ephesians says we are called not only to praise but also to do good works. In Philippians, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross." Jesus was a servant. Are we a servant? Is that how we 
treat those around us every day, our friends, our loved ones, is an attitude of service and humility. That's another area the Holy Spirit's working with me on, and that's being humble, a genuine humility. And our love for God is expressed in how we treat each other. Matthew 37 says, Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine you did for me. God blesses us now and in eternity for our good works for others. Hebrews 6, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. 1 John 4, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command, anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. You know, God is really pleased with us when we do even small things in loving obedience. This is an act of worship. We have small opportunities around us every day. Simple acts like telling the truth, being kind, encouraging others. All of those things please God. First Samuel says, God treasures simple acts of obedience more than our prayers, praise, or offerings. As I was preparing this message, I sat and thought of every single thing I do every day. That's a lot of different things. My job, driving, cooking, shopping, cleaning, interactions with others. Do I worship God in all these things? Do we wake up thanking God for protecting us through the night, for providing the roof over our head, food to eat, a job where we earn our living, clothing, transportation? Do we thank him for our families and our friends and the opportunities that he gives us to serve others? Do we pray for others? Do we pray for our governments, our church leaders, our bosses? I'm working on that one too. You know, at work, genuinely praying. It's funny how you can resist that, but the Holy Spirit when you hang in there, just makes it happen to where it becomes real and godly and not just doing it. I think we've kind of discussed that in an open forum before, is if you don't want to do something, does God still bless it, even if your attitude's not right? But from my experience, I wanted my attitude to be right. And the Holy Spirit, I asked for the Holy Spirit's help to get it right and he answered that prayer. So I, that's my feelings on it. That's my experience. Do we look at all people as children of God, even people that we don't like? Look, Hitler was a really good example. He was a child of God too. And those that were around every day, do we see maybe different nationalities? Do we treat them like a child of God. I've kind of gotten, gotten into the habit of that. Even when you see someone misbehaving, I think that's a child of God and I pray for them, you know, that God might reveal himself to them. 
but they're just as important as I am. God's not a respecter of persons. He loves all of us. I think for me, thinking about these things almost constantly is helping me to walk in them and how I look at people, not as a problem. One of my biggest weaknesses is driving. I am not a patient driver, especially with slow people. And I pray out loud in my car all the time <laughs> about that. But I know the Holy Spirit will bring me there. But I thought one day, well, Diane, you're looking at them as some obstacle in your way, and that's awful. When you look at it that way, that's a terrible thing because they're a child of God. I need to respect that. And I was thinking the other day, what if we could go, we know the Holy Spirit is within us all the time. We know that. But we're still human too, and physical is easier for us to handle. What if you got up in the morning and pictured Jesus by you every moment throughout your whole day, consciously thinking about Jesus being right there? Would it make a difference? Would it make you not say something, you know, that you were going to say that wasn't good? I'm going to try that. I do it a little bit, but I, I get caught up in my work. But I just think that would be something interesting for us to try. It might be helpful. Getting back on the worship. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So, in closing, we live in a world that doesn't want to hear the word obedience. It praises independence, rebellion, sin, anything goes, live for yourself, put yourself first. Believing and following God is for losers. I've heard that on television before. And I remember when I was young in high school, I knew Christian friends a little bit, and I never could understand why they followed God. And that's how a lot of the world is, but God's given us a job to do. We can change that. This church changed that for me. And coming to this particular church has changed me even more. God use, has used y'all as a tool to help me, to encourage me, to teach me, give me a family and a home and a purpose. So we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to submit and obey God in every area of our lives? And do we trust that perfect plan that he has for us? When we go through major changes, maybe delayed promises, impossible problems, unanswered prayers, undeserved criticism, tragedies. Do we trust and obey? I love that song. If you ever, listen, ever read every chorus in there, trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. Is obedience easy? No, it's not meant to be, but when you submit yourself to God and you stay close to Him, it does get easier. I'm finding it is getting easier, that resting and trusting. When we obey God, we can live a life of joy without shame, rooted deeply in the Lord and confident in our eternal hope. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And that freedom is sweet. I'm getting a taste of it, and I want more. Our obedience is actually part of our assurance that we truly know God. I'm learning who God is. If you need help with submitting and obeying God, asking for help. He gives liberally to those who ask good things of him. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. You have the Holy Spirit in you. 
He will help you. I am living proof of it. I ask through the Holy Spirit, and he's giving me that understanding. And he's helping me with self-discipline in my life. Another area of my life, I was eating unhealthy. And I prayed, Holy Spirit, help me to look at it differently. I need, I need to understand it. I want to obey it. I want to change, but I don't know how. I've tried so many times. I prayed this. And I got up on January the 3rd. I started eating healthy, and it wasn't even a big deal. And I eat less. I asked the Holy Spirit to help me look at food as normal, not as an obsession. And it just happened. And the Holy Spirit, he's done wonderful things for me, and he'll do it for you too. And I know y'all are experiencing things too, but the whole purpose of my message is just to deeply encourage you because there's good things waiting for you when you trust and obey 